Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Short Circuit. I'm your host, Daryl Willis, Corporate Vice President of Energy and Resources at Microsoft, and I'm excited to have you join us as we dive into hot topics and trends surrounding the energy transition. In each episode, we'll hear from energy experts and thought leaders who'll be sharing their insights and perspectives on the current state and future of the energy sector. Many corporations, as you know, are setting ambitious sustainability goals to lower the emissions of their operations, supply chain, and products, and Microsoft is no different. At Microsoft, we've set a 100-100-0 commitment to be powered 100% by carbon-free energy at an hourly level by 2030. Today's session is about how that will be achieved, and it's something that's referred to as 24 by 7 free energy supply. And with us, we've got a very special guest, Luke Penny, Senior Business Development Manager of Renewables at Constellation. Constellation is the largest producer of carbon-free energy in the U.S. and a leading supplier of power and energy products and services for homes and businesses across the U.S. They've committed to helping to accelerate the transition to clean energy and have set a goal to have their own electricity generation be 100% carbon-free by 2040. They're going to do this by leveraging innovative technology and enhancing their diverse mix of hydro, wind, solar, and carbon-free nuclear fleet. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Luke. Thanks, Daryl. Great, great to be here. Constellation is the largest producer of carbon-free energy in the U.S. We're excited that you've taken some time to be with us, and we look forward to hearing from you through the uh, conversation that we're going to have today. And I'd like to start by having you say a little bit about yourself and tell us about your role at Constellation and your career journey, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Daryl. Um, so again, my name is Luke Penny, sitting in our solutions group here at Constellation. Um, first seven or eight years of my career, uh, I started out in, in operations, uh, first actually with a large investment bank in their fixed income and commodities division. And then a very, very similar role when I, when I changed to Constellation in 2018. Operations is a it's a wide ranging job function, anything from risk and position management to working with the local grid balancing authorities to ensure everyone's electrons and dollars make it to the right place every day. Overall, a excellent experience that I, I really rely on heavily in my current role. So about two years ago, shortly after we, we finalized our Microsoft Constellation Sustainability Partnership, I was asked to move over to our solutions group to help build out an hourly carbon-free energy tracking and matching application built on Azure, uh, which helps our customers decarbonize their operations hour by hour. And then in late 2022, when that app was launched, my role changed a little bit to focus more on commercializing this solution, uh, identifying strategic alliances and partnerships with those who are interested in that next generation of carbon-free energy procurement. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Very interesting background and interesting journey. So what is it? What does 24 by 7 carbon free energy supply actually mean, Luke? And why is this important to power and utility companies and their customers? And how does that capability, uh, how will Constellation differentiate itself with that capability? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Great questions. 24-7 uh, has gotten quite a bit of uh, attention in, in recent years. It's a bit of a buzzword. And when we when we break it down, it's we're talking about a systemic shift from matching clean energy pr production to consumption annually to matching local clean energy production with energy consumption each hour when and where it's actually needed. So if we think historically energy consumers and policymakers have focused on strategies that ensure enough clean generation is deployed and supported to match or offset certain share of consumed power within the same year. Simple example might be putting solar panels on a, the roof of your store or a company signs a large wind PPA where the total output equals the total amount that you're consuming throughout the given quarter or month or year. And, you know, to date, this has been an excellent approach. It's spurred enormous investments in clean generation deployment. I was looking at the, the CEBA, the Clean Energy Buyers Association deal tracker the other day, and they have that voluntary energy customers have procured over 60 gigawatts of clean energy since 2014, equivalent to just over a quarter of total capacity that's been added to the grid actually in, in that time period. So we see it's driving a, a big driving force that's lowering emissions all across the country. But we do need to make sure that over the next 10 years, we don't see diminishing returns. As the GenStack mm -hmm. 
gets cleaner over time. We risk taking smaller and smaller bites out of that emissions pie if we do continue down the same path we've been on. There are a couple mm -hmm. of reasons for that uh, intermittency of, of renewable generation mm -hmm. and differences in emissions profiles across hours and geographies. So let me let me first touch on intermittency, then we'll, we'll get to the emissions piece. OK, um, so intermittency, right, even in grids with very high levels of renewables penetration, uh, lots of wind and solar uh, or other clean generation, there are still hours throughout the day which are consistently tough to cover. Right. Uh, on the other hand, we've seen parts of the country where there are hours of renewables curtailment, where the output of those generators in a certain location or, or time of day tend to exceed demand. So we're we're actually restricting that output or or wasting it um, mm -hmm. and, and not really maximizing our investment in, in clean tech. So a 24-7 match framework asks us to st take a step back and think about how do we continue to deploy that clean generation in a way that reliably covers all hours while also limiting the risk of overbuild or wasted clean output throughout the day, ensuring that clean energy is available when we turn on the lights. Um, and then secondly, emissions rates. Uh, we know and, and we've studied rec more recently across hours, months, and locations, the emissions created by the electricity grid can vary drastically. If, mm -hmm. if I'm in a grid that's relatively dirty, my operations are in a dirty grid, when I turn on the lights, the emissions associated with my energy usage might be really high. On the other hand, there could be a carbon-free generator located in a grid that's already clean. So if I'm purchasing certificates or power from that generator in the clean grid when I'm in the dirty grid, it's tough to see a path where I ever really get to net zero. We really need to start considering when and where I'm consuming electricity versus when and where that, that carbon-free generator is, is sited and, and uh, dispatching its electrons onto the grid. So Constellation fits into this uh, conundrum in a, in a couple different ways. Uh, number one, we have the largest fleet of carbon-free generation in the U.S. We're also really experienced in finding new build generation, evidenced by strong growth in products like our Core Plus suite of, uh, suite of customer products. And now we also have the analytics and technology platform I mentioned earlier that we built through a partnership with Microsoft, mm -hmm. helps us consider how these decisions affect the grid around us. So we really feel that we have a responsibility to move that needle towards a carbon-free grid every hour of every day. That is fantastic, Luke. And you guys at Constellation, you and the leadership team at Constellation are making significant progress in this area and uh, it is much appreciated and I know much of res much respected around uh, the United States. Microsoft itself was one of the first companies in the world to sign a 24-7 power purchase agreement, hourly purchase agreement, mm -hmm. which was with Vattenfall in Sweden back in 2019, uh, just in advance of COVID. And, uh, but they didn't really have the software uh, that was needed to track this at a at a granular level and with bottlenecks around data ingestion and processing of data becoming being a bit a big constraint uh, and to meet this need we created the azure 24 7 24 7 carbon free energy solution accelerator which has been fantastic but a little bit more than a year ago a little more than a year ago i should say our two organizations announced a partnership Mm -hmm. on the development, as you say, around 24-7, 365 energy matching solutions to enable all of the customers to achieve fully, uh, to achieve and to, to be, to make their net zero ambitions uh, and aspirations, emissions goals yep. possible. So what I would love for you to do is to share, hear your perspective on how digital technology solves the challenges of delivering 24-7 carbon free energy. Yeah, you're exactly you're exactly right, Daryl. We we really believe digital technology can alleviate some of the early roadblocks to adopting a, a 24/7 match plan, sustainability plan. And it's the reason that we spent the better part of 2022 working with you and your team to co-develop a tracking matching platform that can scale to the size of our commercial business. So, at a very high level, the the solution we built together automatically tracks interval usage generation of environmental attributes and hourly emissions profiles in regions where the data is available. 
uh, users can set hourly match sustainability targets, work with Constellation's portfolio management team to select the right mix of carbon-free generators to reliably achieve those targets. And we really believe you can't improve what you can't measure. So having yep. the tools to first analyze your 24-7 current state, your, your hourly emissions footprint, and then take incremental steps to improve upon it is, is how we, we collectively move forward. You also mentioned the ability to scale. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of this could arguably be done in, in spreadsheets, but with the scope of our business and the amount of folks that we need to adopt an hourly match framework to uh, you know, achieve the, the global decarbonization goals that we have in front of us, it begs for automation uh, so, so we can quickly make decisions that are best for us and for our customers. We also don't want to stop there. So mm -hmm. on deck for the collective Constellation Microsoft team this year are looking at improved intraday forecasts from our wind and hydro fleet, hourly matching and emission scenario analysis. Uh, so we can analyze what is the best investment to make next. Mm -hmm. And and also working on local digital metering for consumption sites in parts of the country or, or customer classes where good hourly data isn't already present. And then I also think outside of Constellation and Microsoft, there's been a lot of really, really cool innovative work. Probably the one I'm most excited about is the work that the rec registries, the rec and effect registries have done this year to start minting their certificates on a an hourly basis, whereas historically they've been minted on a monthly or quarterly cadence. And you, you this just adds to the auditability. It, gives everyone one version of the truth and a, a very clear chain of ownership to the, that hour's environmental attribute that you can use to, to track and match to your consumption profile. Awesome. I think the progress, Luke, the progress that we're making together, the progress we've made, I should say, over the last year has been uh, pretty amazing. I know we've got a lot to do, but it's amazing from my point of view, and it's also inspiring. And I look forward to what is to come as we uh, continue to work together going forward. I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about energy storage and, and in particular nuclear power. And I'd love mm -hmm. to get your perspective on how you see energy storage and nuclear power fitting with 24-7. Yeah, great. Um, so over the past year or two, as we've really started to dive into our 24-7 pilot with our customers' data, it's been incredibly interesting to see how the various generation technology profiles align with consumption and emissions patterns in, in different parts of the country. And if I just step back and have one takeaway from all of our work, it's that we're really going to need an all hands on deck approach uh, from all carbon free technologies in order to hit that 100% goal. Specifically, we see the largest benefits of if we're talking about storage and nuclear and firm and dispatchable clean technologies, it's achieving the last 10 to 20 percent of hours matching um, where the grid typically has relied on fossil fuels for reliability and balancing services. Uh, we, we know we can decarbonize a lot of the grid using existing tools in the tool belt, wind, solar, short term storage. But eventually, the cost and complexity to move from, let's say, 75% clean to 100% clean mm -hmm. is going to get very expensive and complicated without enough firm dispatchable resources at our disposal. And that's where these new, new technologies, you mentioned SMR, there's some advanced geothermal, um, longer duration storage, as well as the continued expansion of existing technologies that we have today, large nuclear, large hydro, have the greatest potential and really a reason that we're making long-term commitments in all of the above to develop those areas. Um, lastly, I want to touch on hydrogen. It's mm -hmm. also an incredibly interesting uh, process that can, uh, an element that can decarbonize both inside and outside the scope of the electricity grid. We think about industrial manufacturing, transportation sectors, and we know that clean Hydrogen, creating clean hydrogen using electrolysis means we're going mm -hmm. to need a lot of dedicated clean energy resources, ideally located in the same grid and supplying energy at the times when the hydrogen is actually being produced. Fantastic. I mean, I, I'm uh, as a former scientist and I call myself a former scientist because I've not been one in a long time. I'm just excited and amazed about all of the conversations that are taking place around hydrogen and nuclear, SMRs, et cetera, because 
as you say, all it's going to require all all sources of energy on deck and all hands on deck for us to to solve this very complicated decarbonization challenge. And the decarbonization of the grid is so important. And even at Microsoft, Luke, we realize that us meeting our ambitions around being carbon negative by 2050, taking all of the carbon we put into the environment out uh, mm -hmm. by 20, by being carbon negative by 2030 and taking all of the carbon that we put in the environment out by 2050 is highly dependent, interdependent on the world transitioning to a clean energy infrastructure. And that's why this partnership and relationship with Constellation is so important. And I'd like to talk a little bit about partnerships and regulations and get your take on a few things. And the first question I have for you in this regard is, are there government policies and regulations that impact the need for 24-7? And the second question I'll ask you before you answer that first one is any initiatives that exist today as we think about the Inflation Reduction Act or the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act uh, that will help accelerate 24-7? So a two-part question. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, maybe I'll take the second part first. Okay. The, the IRA and you mentioned the IIJA. Yes. Uh, both huge, huge wins for our country and for the clean energy industry as a whole. Um, even if those don't specifically address 24-7 matching, mm -hmm. both acts include a lot of needed support for clean energy that enables a 24-7 future. So uh, one of the areas that we're most excited about in, in the acts are uh, a first-time set of technology-neutral tax credits for CFE that's supportive of all the technologies we just talked about and can complement traditional tax credits that have been around for a number of years for wind and solar. Uh, so really investing in, in that, that whole, all hands on deck approach that we talked about. In addition, the IIJA also included direction for the federal government to make hourly emissions data widely available, uh, which is, is going to be huge for data standardization and measurement. Uh, it, a lot of that data is available today through private partnerships, um, so not for profit companies, excellent work we partner with a few to to deliver our technology solution to our customers but having a, a federally recognized standard data set is is going to be huge so we know we're comparing apples to apples um outside of those acts the, the federal government did set a goal of pr procuring 100 percent carbon free energy 50 percent of which must be matched 24 7. Uh, wow. just that that leadership from an entity of their size and scope is bound to have beneficial ripple effects down through the rest of the market, uh, really leading the way for corporates and, and other small government entities, municipalities to consider setting those next level goals as well. And then thinking a bit outside of the federal arena, we mm -hmm. are eagerly awaiting and participating in WRI's GHG protocol revision process. So WRI is the World Resource Institute. They publish a set of greenhouse gas corporate reporting protocols that have really become the gold standard over the, the last number of years. So recognizing the grid is evolving, the standards that corporates are following to report their carbon footprints also need mm -hmm. to evolve. They're accepting feedback and, and reviewing content that will consider next generation concepts like hourly matching, carbon displacement accounting, uh, how do we define additionality and emissionality, and how to treat emerging technologies like storage and SMRs, which may not have had incredibly clear guidance in the past. Uh, this is, frankly, it's a huge opportunity to, to move the needle in the right direction, but there's also a bit of a risk if we get it wrong. You know, so many corporates rely on the protocol to make their clean energy investments uh, so that they have an on balance sheet impact and and going down the wrong path could put us in, in a place where we don't want to be. So everyone's feedback is incredibly important. And again, one of the reasons that we're, we're very closely tied to that work. Fantastic. And you just taught me uh, a new term, which is emissionality, which is uh, very interesting um, and, and appropriate, I would say. Um, and you also reminded me when you were making your comments, Luke, about the fact that it's really going to take all kinds of partnerships and relationships and alignment to pull this off for not only for the United States and North America, but for the world. And the alignment of policies, the alignment around partnerships, public and private, big and small, working together 
to get to net zero by 2050, assuming it is easier said than done. And I'm grateful that uh, we're on this journey with uh, with Constellation. And uh, and I have no doubt that working together, we'll get there. So I have one last question for you. Sure. I know you've got a busy day ahead of you, and we thank you for your time. My last question as we wrap up this episode of The Short Circuit is really around, besides the work you're doing, what really excites you most about the future of the energy industry? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question. Uh, so I'm going to answer in two parts. Um, okay. First, sort of at the at the micro level, right? I spend most of my day thinking about hourly carbon free energy markets, and and it's uh, it's what I'm, I'm focused on. It's what what I you know really think can can have a big impact. But constantly, I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised, and excited about other areas of decarbonization, other research, other scientific breakthroughs that are happening that are outside of my day to day. Uh, just the other day, I uh, had dinner with a, a, a company that is working on stripping carbon from natural gas to make hydrogen. And then it, it, cre it creates this offshoot carbon substance, which can be used to enhance the elasticity of, of rubber and ink uh, while having the benefit of the clean hydrogen. And I was just floored that uh, it sounds like science fiction to me. It I does. am not a scientist by background. Uh, it's incredible that folks are, are working on that and, and have use cases out there in the market. Um, but at a, at a higher level, at a macro level, I think I'm most excited about the industry's collective commitment to working on this big climate change problem together. I'm constantly amazed by the breadth of industry participation in some newly formed associations that we're that we're working with, like Energy Tag, the UN 24/7 Council. Um, you know, we have energy suppliers, renewable developers, oil and gas companies, um, energy buyers from a wide array of industries, including companies that in many respects are competitors in, in their day jobs. But it's been so refreshing to see those folks come together with the mutual understanding that we have a bigger problem facing us and mm -hmm. everyone deserves and needs a seat at the table if we're going to avoid the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, uh, cliff that, that we're quickly approaching. Awesome, thank you, uh, Luke. Thank you for those reflections. And uh, folks, that brings us to the close of another great episode of The Short Circuit. And I'd like to thank Luke for joining us today. Luke, thanks for sharing your insights and perspectives. And more importantly, thank you for the partnership that Constellation has with Microsoft. And I look forward to continuing going forward. I'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for joining us today. We hope the conversation has provided you with a better understanding of how we're working together with industry leaders like Constellation and leaders like Luke to deliver 24-7 carbon-free energy, all in service of a decarbonized energy future, which is the destination. Be sure to join us next time as we continue to unpack key topics and trends surrounding the energy transition. Thank you very much.